Okay, so I've got a big pop up on my screen right in a minute. There we go. Okay, so uh, my name's um, Sean Clark. I'm here with my colleague Sean Carroll, and we're from um, Leicester, the Computer Arts Archive and Oxford University. So um, the talk I'm giving today is about a process we've gone through to rebuild a um, early interactive computer artwork called Communication Game that was created by Ernest Edmonds in the um, very early 1970s. So, as I mentioned, the uh, game or the artwork was developed by Edmonds in 1970 and first shown as part of Stroud Cornock's event, The Inventions of Problems 2 at Leicester Polytechnic um, in 1971. Leicester Polytechnic is now Demontford University. And um, back in the 70s, as I mentioned last night, there was a lot of pioneering and very interesting um, experimentation with digital art and um, interactive art at Stroud Cornock and Ernest Edmonds were involved in. This was a um, Ernest Edmonds project from the era. So this is presented was presented as a conceptual art piece in the form of a, an interactive experiment in which um, people were separated by distance and could communicate through lights and switches. Uh, so it was driven by an interest that Ernest, um, Ernest Edmonds had in how young people, infants, learn communication and actually learn generally. And he was inspired to create this sort of experimental artwork in which the communication process is, if you like, non-obvious. Um, it took the form, in its first incarnation, of a series of booths that were connected via um, uh, electronics, not really computers as such, and people could flip switches and see lights happen within their booth. So I've got some examples of how it looks. Well, first of all, I thought I'd show this picture of um, Ernest um, standing on the right and Stroud Cornock inside um, this area here. This is not of the communication games artwork. I think this was part of Datapack, another work they were creating at the time. It maybe gives you a little bit of context. We're talking early 1970s. I think that device in front of Ernest may be some sort of plotter, um, gigantic machine, and possibly next to him might be a computer. It's certainly a box with switches on. <laughs> Could well be a computer of the era. <laughs> um, so the communication, um, communications game itself, as you can see in this sketch, this incarnation was like a series of booths. <laughs> People would enter the booths and they would see switches and lights. They could toggle the switches and things would happen to the lights. But it wasn't a simple or obvious connection between the two. You would flip a light and depending on the state of the entire system, you might get a different response back. Or you might be standing there not doing anything and the light switches on because it's been triggered by someone else. And in Ernest's notes here, he's sort of sketching out how the connections between what I refer to as the terminals operate. And those terminals could be positioned in a different way. This is a version where this sort of pyramid form contains the lights and switches is separated by um, the sort of screen so three people can operate this at once a bit more compact and the communication or if you like the definition of the relationship between the lights and the switches was produced according to a truth table a logic table um, however it wasn't using a computer it was actually using logic circuits so i would most definitely call it a digital artwork because it contains <coughs> digital binary um, mappings and representations, but it wasn't a computer-based <coughs> artwork as such. Um, and there are some remaining materials, such as this sketch showing, and I think this was actually a sketch for a sound-based version of the artwork, and you can just about see a representation of capacitors and resistors and things like that. So it's very much a electronically constructed project of artwork, but because of the binary nature of it, I would most definitely call it a digital piece. Now, interestingly, when Ernest was writing up this work, and he's very good at writing up his work as a researcher as well as an artist, he just made a little note of the timeline. So the first concept, first idea for the piece was in 1970. It was then built and exhibited at Stroud Cornock's um, Invention of Problems 2 in 71. And then he makes a note here where he says that the artwork actually is the specification of the artwork, not the, the physical bits themselves. It's a very systems approach. 
So what he's saying is that the artwork is not just the, the atoms, the stuff that made it, but it's the specification, specification of the relationship between the parts. Um, and I think he's also making a note here about it would potentially be recreated at creativity and cognition a few years ago. Um, that's, that middle point, the specification point, reminded me of a, a famous quote by Solowit. Now, if anybody is interested in systems art, and I would call myself a systems artist themselves, Solowit said the system is the work of art, so the specification in earnest language. And the visual work of art is the proof of the system. The visual aspect can't be understood without understanding the system. It isn't what it looks like, but what it is that is of basic importance. Um, I thought this was very interesting because what he's saying is that the idea of the artwork, the system is the thing that matters. And that gives us permission, if you like, to recreate that work and to create a genuine version of it, even though none of the original materials remain. We don't have any of the switches or lights or boobs and whatever. However, Solowitz's quote here, and Ernest's um, sort of effective version of that, gives us permission to create something and call it the work of art. We can follow the specification and what we produced will be a copy of that artwork. So why is this artwork significant? Well, personally, I think it was a very early example of an interactive and digital artwork. The interactivity was simple. It was switches and lights. Um, and it was digital because it had a binary truth table inside. Um, it's made of logic circuits. Um, I think it's probably an early example of an electronic logic based artwork. Of course, people, artists had used electronics um, for 100 years in artworks. Um, Marcel Duchamp was known for his, some of his uh, pieces that were made out of motors and spinning discs and whatever. Um, but this was a piece that actually had logic circuits embedded within it. It was multi-user and in a sense it was a networked artwork. People may have been in different locations nearby, but they were connected by wires. Now, of course, we're talking early 1970s. The internet sort of existed, but it didn't exist in an everyday usable form with Ethernet wires and things like that. So Ernest had to create his own network. But it's a good example of an early networked artwork. And also, I think if you were interested in understanding Edmund's later work, such as Shaping Forms and Cities Tango, this would be a very good starting point for you to explore some of his initial ideas. And I think another point that makes this significant is that it doesn't physically exist. There aren't versions of this that are stored in galleries or lofts or whatever. Um, so if we were going to explore this piece, we would have to recreate it. Now, of course, there have been a number of other recreations of digital artworks, finding digital artworks recently. We've had um, uh, Gordon Pass colloquy of mobiles that was shown at cybernetic serendipity that's been rebuilt with the support of somebody who was in Gordon Pass's team and the Sensor robotic work by Edward Inatovich, that has been, uh, well, I wouldn't say, even say recreated, it was using some of the original materials and it's been rebuilt from those um, materials. So I think it's important, well, I'll come on to this a bit later, but it's significant that people are thinking about recreating early artworks where they no longer exist. So the first rebuild, and I'll start showing you some pictures in case it's not clear yet how the artwork would function. Um, I was involved in rebuilding the piece in 2017 for an exhibition of Ernest's work at um, De Montfort University. And I constructed it using a number of Arduinos and then contemporary switches and LEDs. The original version didn't use LEDs, it used bulbs, but of course LEDs are devices to use now. And I created um, the pyramid form of one of the early versions of communications game using the same logic table. So this is the mapping between the switches and the lights. Of course, it was made in circuitry back then. I was able to simulate or produce the same functionality using an Arduino programmable microcontroller. Um, I was given some notes. This it also shows the relationship between the switches and lights. And there are two levels of complexity within the artwork. One is the logic table that turns switches into light sequences, but then in order to produce the individual parts that are operated by the user, there's some interconnectedness between the different terminals, as I come to call them. And this was the early pyramid version. You can see the lights in the row at the top and the switches underneath, and you would switch the lights, or you would switch 
the switches and you would see the lights um, come on and off in a, what I would call a non-obvious way. The idea here wasn't that you would have this simple relationship, switch, switch and the light comes on. Because there are multiple users and these terminals are interwired, you would have to really quite, ex you would have to explore in order to understand, understand elements of the relationship between the parts. And to an extent, without other forms of communication, it would be very difficult for you to work out what was going on. But of course you would experiment and that's the point of the work. What we are in trying to do in a situation like this is to try and work it out. Yeah. Now, what we can say is that the whole piece is deterministic. There aren't random numbers randomly switching lights on and off. So if that was the case, then it wouldn't be a very rewarding experience because there, you know there is no relationship between the switches and the lights. There is a determined relationship, but it's complex. It's a difficult one to reverse engineer unless you know about the whole system. And it was embedded within these three um, sort of screens. And there's a young user of it when it was shown in 2017. I think this might be one of Ernest's um, granddaughters. And if you look inside the pyramid, it was all made from wires and switches and then um, Arduino logic added to it and so on. It was very, it was quite packed. It's actually quite complex, literally complicated. Um, given that it, you might think it's quite a simple work. So that was quite successful. The piece was recreated, um, I guess it was 2017, so 45 years after it was, 46 years after it was originally created. Um, I think I would say it was a successful rebuild, but it also opened up the possibility that maybe using some other contemporary technology, we could expand the system so that we would be true to its original specification, which is the artwork, but also we could explore using certain elements of modern technology to enhance the work. So I've developed a technology that I use in my own artwork called ArcThings, which is a lightweight communication system that allows microcontrollers and web browsers and um, computers to communicate with each other using Internet of Things technology, in particular something called MQTT. Um, I use that because I can run the same tech on a two pound microcontroller that I run on a 2000 pound um, MacBook and the communication works across all those different systems. So I thought, well, could we use art things to power the communication with inside communications game? Um, could I make multiple terminals, that's what like I mentioned, I called them, that would connect to each other over the internet? Then, of course, might it be possible to create a web version of this, so an internet version, software only version? If so, we could make very large, highly distributed versions of communication games. Um, that could be used by people all over the world. I should also add that the communication games, it was not just one work, it was a series of works. Um, the one that I recreated was one of a series of works and some did involve sound as well. So if you look at the second rebuild, so this is one of the standalone terminals. Um, you have lights and switches and intentionally I, intentionally I chose a slightly retro looking um, set of components, but it doesn't have to look like this because remember we're creating the we're duplicating the functionality, not the physical look and feel of the piece. It doesn't have to look like it was made 50 years ago to be a valid representation of the artwork. And inside you see a microcontroller that has internet connectivity and loads of wires connecting the switches and LEDs. Now this version here, I actually have worked out a way of simplifying it and reducing the number of wires. And that's quite handy because I was going to bring this and show it live and I was putting it all together last week and because it's so compact I managed to break the microcontroller <laughs> so I'm building a slightly bigger version to give me a bit more space so that I don't end up doing that. However we can show you the web version today so this is a version that runs on mobile phones or the internet this is a terminal and um, you will control the switches underneath they're like sort of toggle switches and then you will see what happens to the LEDs. You know that you're part of a network. If things happen that you haven't triggered, then you know it must be somebody else who's done that. So we're going to try and do a live demo and Sean Carroll is going to help. So what we have here, I just want to reload on that, okay, <laughs> are three terminals. And I created the three terminals so that I could run it and help it debug. You wouldn't normally show somebody three terminals. They would just see the one terminal. 
What Sean has on his phone is a single terminal of a row of switches and a row of LEDs. Now I can choose to flip switches. And if you just try and look at one terminal at a time, you'll see that there's, there's not an obvious relationship between what's happening when I press a button. Here, I sort of, if I'm looking at the top terminal, terminal, I can see that this is sort of connected, but on this button here, nothing seems to happen. That's because it's triggering changes in other terminals. And then every now and then something will happen that I haven't triggered. So this is a, a need to do a little bit more verification, but I believe it's an accurate representation of how communication game in its original form works. But it's also started to make me think about how you could use communication like this in other artworks. And I'm, I would be interested in ex well, well, carry on working with Ernest, but also to expand and extend the system so that I can create contemporary artworks that use that. So, and if you want to have a closer look, I can chat with you afterwards as well, if you need to understand a bit more about it. So let's quickly go back to the slides. So I think I'm getting towards the end of my time. So reflections. So as a, a reflective practitioner, <coughs> I, I'm a digital artist, but I use research and reflective practice as a way of informing my future artworks. That was how I um, undertook my research program as a PhD. Some of the initial reflections are first of all that a lot of early digital artworks will most will undoubtedly be lost and have been lost already unless we preserve or rebuild them and there is a value in doing that because um, all art forms should build on the prior successes and failures of earlier artworks i can't think of any other art form that is not aware of its history like digital arts Lots of digital artists don't even think anything that's not created on the latest computer is even worthy of the name digital art. But what we have here is a digital artwork that was created using circuitry, not even computers. And in many cases, certainly with communication game, because of the apparent complexity, I'll mention the word complexity again in a minute, being able to speak to the artist was vital. If I was given a big pile of circuits, imagine they had survived, and somebody said, all oh, right, this is communication game. Can you um, make it work? Well, unless you can speak to the artist, or in Ernest's case, you have good documentation, you're not going to be able to reconstruct it. And so I feel we should engage with our history and where appropriate, we should preserve and reconstruct early digital artworks as just part of our general digital arts heritage and our ability to make them better works. So being able to speak to the artist is vital. Now I take a systems approach to creating my artworks. And for me, terms like complexity, and communication, feedback, and so on, are very important to how my work operates. And what you see within communication game is how a simple set of rules can lead to apparently complex behavior and ideas. And I don't mean complicated, I don't mean like all the wiring is complicated. I mean the idea that the system exhibits complexity. It's non-obvious connections between different parts of it, and those relationships aren't necessarily linear. Um, and I think those ideas are very relevant now. When we're looking at an ever increasingly complicated world, the emergence of complexity is inevitable and complexity is difficult for humans to understand. We like simple things, we like linear relationships, complex relationships of the nature that we're surrounded by now are interesting things for us artists to engage with. Um, and I also think as a personal reflection, you rarely get, as a digital artist, you rarely get to look deeply into the construction of another digital artist's piece. So in many cases, um, I don't know how many people here who call themselves artists have looked at other people's code, for example, or looked at other people's constructions of the work they've created in detail. You might say, oh, well, I know that piece is created in Maxim SP, and it, but have you really studied how the piece works? And I had the opportunity here to study the piece in quite a lot of detail and because Ernest is still with us and he's available and more than happy to talk about his work I can now go back and try to uncover some of the interesting ideas that he was exploring at the time and obviously I will write those up in future but it will also help me to improve my practice my work so I found it a very rewarding process as an artist and I believe it's a valuable process in terms of informing our digital arts history and it's something I would like to encourage others to think about, looking at early artworks and where appropriate, reconstruct or preserve them. And with that, I'd like to finish. And if you like, I can take a quick question, otherwise we'll move on.
Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Um, what you said about specifications reminded me of Dan Flavin. I don't know if you know oh, his artworks okay. with uh, fluorescent tubes. Oh, yes. But he, yeah. he used to do, uh, well, you had to buy your own tubes essentially, mm. so you just get some instructions on how to make it. But he made them limited editions, so there are only you know, eight, eight sets of instructions, and then you yes. made the artworks. Yeah. So, uh, well, that is very it, much yeah. the approach of the systems yeah. artist, yeah. the artist who believes that the system is the art, yeah. not the yeah. construction. Yeah, yes. Mm -hmm. So, we just another example came to mind. Mm -hmm. Anyone, any questions? So, thanks, Sean. You mentioned that a lot is learned by reconstructing another mm -hmm. artist's work some years after it's originally been produced. Yeah. And I think you mentioned Gordon Pask. Mm. And of course, that's a very interesting case because he produced his great mobile feature at Seren, um, Cybernetic Serendipity in 1968. I always claim that I'm one of the few people here who saw it and went to that exhibition. I always make a big point of that. Um, and um, I think I gave a paper in, at EVA few years ago. Um, and as you know, that whole piece has been reproduced in Detroit. And um, I've only seen that on film. I, I showed pictures of it and it looks absolutely marvelous. Um, it probably works much better uh, than it did for Gordon Pask. He was known as a mechanical genius, as I think you're aware. Mm -hmm. And he was also probably an electronic genius, as well as a maverick. Um, he started off being a doctor, but obviously he would never have made it. Um, so I always think, and it's just as you rebuilt Ernest's um, piece here, one day I'm rather hoping that that piece from Detroit will come here. Yeah. If not, we all have to go there. Well, I would love to put on an exhibition where we bring together a number yeah. of reconstructed pieces and original artifacts from that late 60s, early 70s era. And I'd love to bring sensor and communication going, maybe data back and other things that we're looking at. Um, and Gordon Passwork would be a, a great addition. So that, that's an interactive, for people who don't know probably of mobiles, it's multiple large hanging yeah. forms, which are male, female, and I think there might be a third gender involved in some of them. I think it's just male and female. <laughs> just male and female, okay. <laughs> Not quite that heavy this time. Um, and they communicate, they send messages to each yeah. other through light. And what you then end up with is through this simple ability to transmit and receive a message, again, the emergence of complexity. Complex behaviors coming out of seemingly simple um, sets of interactions. Yeah. Okay. Then, anyone else? We, we are running short. All right, one, one more question here. So. I wanted to ask if there was a, any resource where one could go find out, find out more about um, recreative artworks that one could then bring to, because not everyone can live in London, Berlin, Tokyo. And, yeah. Um, but it sounds like if you're thinking about a show, that <laughs> there isn't really a resource where one can find this out. There isn't yet, but yeah. what I'd like to do, and I need to talk to Ernest Edmonds about this, is that I'd like to start opening up some of this, uh, these early systems and making them available yeah. online. Um, so long as he's happy with that, and then people could download and construct their own versions, and then of course they can experiment with that as a way of understanding what's going on. Uh, and for any other artists? For the other artworks, the Edward Inatovich um, Sensor piece, um, there's a lot of information online, and Colloquy of Mobiles likewise. Other pieces, I'm not so aware of high profile pieces, but it would be good, wouldn't it, if we could actually access a lot of yeah, information about constructing and reconstructing early artworks. And so watch this space. Yeah, that's it. <laughs>